Good morning, everybody. Welcome again for uh, this uh, yeah, Instituto Astrofisica de Andalusia colloquium series. And today we have uh, the talk by Dr. Cora Music. She will talk about the Milky Way's young substellar population. And uh, Cora will be properly introduced by Dr. Isabel Marquez, our uh, scientific director of the project. Isabel. Thank you. And, uh, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for attending uh, this new Severotua web document. It's a pleasure for us uh, today to have uh, Dr. Borali Kamuchik. Uh, so um, uh, she completed her PhD at the University of Cologne uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Germany in 2008. And afterwards, uh, she held a number of postdoctoral positions, first at the University of, of Cologne in, in Germany, then at the University of Toronto in Canada, the University of Diego Portales in Chile. And then she got an, an ESO fellowship in, in Chile. Since January 2017, she works as a researcher at the Center for Astrophysics uh, and Gravitation, the center called CENTRA of the University of Lisbon in, in Portugal, our, our dearest neighbors in Europe, and is also a visiting professor as, at the University of Split in Croatia. Dr. Mucic's uh, research focuses on the area of uh, low mass stars and brown dwarfs, <clears throat> excuse me, studying different channels through which we can find clues about the dominant mechanism of their formation. She's one of the key investigators of the sub, uh, survey substellar objects in nearby young clusters, SONIC, uh, one of the most successful efforts in finding young brown dwarfs and characterizing their mass and spatial distributions. C currently, she is leading a project to look for these objects in massive young clusters, environments largely different from uh, uh, those studied in, in, in Sonic. The project has been awarded time as the James Webb Space Telescope, and uh, in addition to large uh, ground based observatories. Dr. Mujitz is also participating in the development of the mid infrared instrument METIS for the ESO ELT, for the extremely large telescope in, in, in Chile. Today, she will tell us more about what we have learned about the young brown dwarf population in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, including application of supervised machine learning techniques in the characterization of low mass stars and substellar objects and your future development using the um, James Webb Space uh, Telescope. So um, I acknowledge again, uh, Cora, for accepting our invitation to give us this uh, web vacuum. I, I take the opportunity for uh, extending this invitation for any person one in the near, uh, in the near future. Thank you very much, uh, Cora, and the board is yours. Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you for the introduction and, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I really love coming to Granada. Unfortunately, I'm not there in person, but I'm, I hope this year I will, I will come and visit you. So today I'm gonna to tell you about uh, what we have learned about Milky Way's young substellar population. This is a kind of a summary talk of, of, of many, many years of work, really. I will present, uh, but I will mostly concentrate at the end of, on the most recent things, of course. So this is, uh, of, of course, the work where many people have been uh, uh, included and this is really a non-exhaustive list. There are many more of them. These are my principal collaborators and the first two that I'm highlighting here are part of my group here uh, in Lisbon and lots of work that I'm showing today uh, has been done also by them. So this is the outline of my talk. I will tell you a little bit about what are brown dwarfs and why actually we want to study these kinds of objects and how do we actually recognize a young brown dwarf. So I want to stress just here that uh, in this talk, I'm concentrating on, in my research, I'm concentrating on young brown dwarfs. So we are interested really in, um, in, in these objects uh, at, at the beginning of their lifetimes for several reasons. And, and the first one being uh, that we, are, we, want to start, we want to understand their formation, right? their formation scenarios. Uh, I will tell you about what we have learned about the population of brown dwarfs in, across different environments. This includes nearby star forming regions all the way to very massive um, clusters that we can actually um, observe. Uh, you know, brown dwarfs are very faint, so, so you need really big telescopes to get to observe them at, at larger distances. And at the end, I will shortly tell you about our future plans using JWST since 
well, it, uh, the launch has been very successful. So I'm really hoping that uh, this and the next year we are going to get some very exciting data. So what are brown dwarfs? Uh, brown dwarfs are objects that in mass somehow bridge the realms of stars and the planets. They are objects that are not sufficiently massive to sustain hydrogen fusion in their center. So this is the main difference uh, from stars, because you know the stars have a, uh, a fusion that is actually supporting them again, uh, then against the gravitational collapse. Um, in case of brown dwarfs, they are supported actually by the electron degeneracy pressure. Now on the high mass side uh, spectrum of brown dwarfs, uh, the highest mass uh, brown dwarfs have masses of about 75 Jup Jupiter masses. And this is a well-defined limit, which is um, determined by the mass limit where for the objects that can or cannot burn hydrogen. Now, the minimum mass for brown dwarfs is not so clear. Um, uh, in fact, the International Astronomical Union has a definition where brown dwarfs extend down to the what is called the deuterium burning limit. Deuterium actually ignites at lower temperatures than hydrogen. So at the beginning of their lifetimes, uh, brown dwarfs above 13 Jupiter masses will actually uh, burn, have nuclear fusion in, in form of hydrogen, oh, sorry, deuterium. <laughs> um, but there is only a small amount of deuterium in the ISM. So this will, this will really short, uh, uh, this will have very short duration in general. And so, um, often this deuterium burning limit is taken as a limit for brown dwarf mass. However, we have found, as I will show you, objects that we estimate they have lower masses than this. So we found several Jupiter mass objects free floating in nearby star forming regions. So they are not orbiting stars. So, uh, so then by definition, they are not planets. So I think the, actually the, a good way to distinguish between maybe brown dwarfs and planets would be by their formation scenarios. However, um, however, this is not so easy to, um, to separate, as I will uh, show you very soon. Now, brown dwarfs, uh, well, first to say, stars, as you probably know, follow a mass-luminosity relation. So if you, uh, if you know the luminosity of a star, which is what we measure typically, you can, from the models, uh, we can estimate uh, mass with some uh, with some good precision. However, in terms of in, in case of brown dwarfs, things are a little bit more complicated be, because we have a degeneracy also with the age. So what have what I'm showing in this plot is basically the time evolution of objects of different masses. So this in blue, this upper object, these are stars. So they in the beginning, while they're contracting, so their luminosity is going down. But at some point when they ignite hydrogen in their centers, they stabilize their luminosity and they enter to uh, the main sequence, right? For brown dwarfs, this doesn't happen. Brown dwarfs actually, so here in the beginning, burn uh, burn uh, deuterium for a short while. And then after the deuterium is uh, exhausted, they start cooling off and they keep basically cooling off forever. And if you go below 13 uh, Jupiter masses, so these are objects here shown in, in red. Uh, well, you are not even having this uh, short phase of uh, deuterium fusion, you are just uh, these objects just simply uh, keep cooling off over their lifetimes. So something to keep in mind is that brown dwarfs keep changing their spectral type uh, as they age, right? So, um, so there is the, this, we don't call, it's not mass luminosity relation that I satisfy, but it's also mass luminosity age relation. And as you know, knowing ages of objects, of stars in general is different, is difficult. And, um, and so this is why it's also very useful to observe these objects in star forming regions, because we know to some um, extent uh, their ages, right? And just also to mention that, uh, so I said that, that yeah, they change their luminosities, they change their spectral types. So star brown dwarf transition happens at the spectral type M6 at one mega year, but for, for the field population, for all uh, brown dwarf, so for example, one giga year uh, brown dwarf will uh, will actually have, I mean, the most massive brown dwarf, so this is just the transition, will be at around the spectral type uh, L3. I'm today mostly concentrating on this very young population. So M6 is, around, uh, is approximately the transition uh, value that we, that we consider. So now, 
how do you form a brown dwarf? So this is still one of um, uh, the big unknowns in, in star formation, although we are getting some clues, of course, from the observations and from many different types of simulations. And so here, here are the most uh, prominent channels for formation of brown dwarfs. So the first one would be as a star. This is um, typically uh, described in a framework of what we call turbulent fragmentation, because you need turbulence actually to compress the um, the cores to or, or to compress the gas to some uh, relatively high density. So in fact, the problem with um, the problem with forming brown dwarfs is that you know that the genes mass scales inversely proportionally with density. So if you want a very small fragment to collapse, so to, to become unstable, um, then you need very high densities. And achieving these high densities is, is in the ISM is not trivial. Other, another uh, process that is invoked for brown dwarf formation is uh, similar to giant planets. So that, that you have a disk fragmentation, uh, although you can also have other planet formation scenarios, in, in fact, uh, uh, at place in work. Um, but once you form um, this massive object, so this is shown in these simulations, if, if, uh, due to some interactions, gravitational interactions, uh, some of the objects uh, will be actually ejected from this system. So this is another way how you can form um, a free floating brown dwarf, although it uh, indeed had formed as a planet still. So this goes along what I was telling you, you know, how do you distinguish between brown dwarf and planets? The best way would be according to their formation. However, by observation, it's very difficult to, to, to know how an object has formed, right? What is the past of each particular object? Other scenarios for brown dwarf formations are, um, um, include halting actually accretion onto these objects. So for example, you can have, uh, so these are some simulations of formation of star clusters where you have uh, multiple systems forming their gravitational interactions in these systems, and then the small bodies will be preferentially ejected. And so then they are simply removed from the, uh, from the regions of high gas densities and they simply don't have enough material to accrete. And finally, finally, uh, the last scenario I want to present here is the photo evaporation. So it, uh, it has been invoked. So if you have a massive star and some intermediate mass core that would normally form <clears throat> a star, if uh, you know the, the radiation pressure um, uh, can, can actually blow parts of this, this core and then leave you just with a small fragment uh, that, uh, that, um, that can then only form a brown dwarf because it doesn't have sufficient mass to form a star. Now we know that photo, photo evaporation uh, would be um, a process that works best or well, it, you need a massive star. So you need a core that is in a vicinity of massive stars. And we know that brown dwarfs also exist in regions that contain absolutely no O and B stars. So we know that photo evaporation um, from the star that it's, it cannot be a dominant process, but of course it can form some fraction of brown dwarfs. So I would, this is like a, a small summary. What do we, uh, what, is kind of a current consensus all in the community, although this will depend very much on whom you ask, uh, that majority of brown dwarfs, at least more massive brown dwarfs, uh, may be forming uh, in a way similar as stars. Um, this conclusion comes from, um, from, well, lots of research where people have found that young brown dwarfs actually share many properties with low mass stars. So they share mass distribution in sense that you know there are no bumps, uh, it, mass distribution seems to be continuous across the hydrogen burning limit. They have similar kinematics and spatial distributions. Brown dwarfs have disks and they have outflows. These are all characteristics of low mass stars. This has been observed with ALMA, with, with other instruments, uh, I mean disks. Um, there are actually objects that can be considered pre and proto brown dwarfs. So, the, so these are pro brown dwarfs that are really still uh, in the process of formation. Uh, and also the multiplicity properties um, kind of, they are not the same as, as in the case of the stars, but there is like a smooth transition from stellar realm towards the brown dwarfs. So all of this together kind of is uh, what leads people to think that probably majority of brown dwarfs may be forming uh, similar to stars. However, I would add that this is um, down to some certain mass. So I would say more massive brown dwarfs probably do form for the less massive brown dwarfs. We, uh, yeah, we still don't know. 
and and of course other mechanisms here I, I wouldn't say they are not excluded but really the the relative importance of each of these uh, mechanisms is not clear and also quite difficult uh, to find right so what are the questions that that are left i would say uh, in brown dwarf formation there are, well there are several but here are the most important ones that i'm personally personally maybe interested in so the first one would be how far in mass does the uh, the stellar IMF extend, or the IMF? How, how far does it extend? So basically, we want to try to to see, um, you know, try to observe fainter and fainter objects and less and less massive objects, and see uh, how does that distribution look like. And then, as I said, the lowest mass objects is really unclear if they would form like stars or like planets or anything else. And finally, the one that I'm I'm highlighting in particular is uh, is the question of the environment environmental dependency of brown dwarf formation. Uh, so because this is something that I have been concentrated on in the last uh, few years, so I'm going to uh, probably say most talk mostly about that. And why this question? Uh, if you ask the theory, so why why the question is the brown, brown dwarf formation environment dependent? Uh, it comes basically from the theoretical expectations. Most of the scenarios, uh, in, uh, in fact, predict that you would need uh, that well that the enhancement in stellar density in gas density and the presence of massive stars should uh, should influence the brown dwarf formation so if you have more stars so these are simulations of uh, gas in falling on stellar clusters uh, which then um, form brown dwarfs uh, and if you, wherever you have higher density of objects you start uh, forming also more brown dwarfs in this case, this is a, a simulation by Jones and Bate where they see so that, that the gas density, so this is a denser uh, cloud uh, and this is a less dense, cl dense cloud. And so the denser clouds will uh, tend to form more low mass objects. Then in the vicinity of massive stars, as I said, you could have the process of photo evaporation. So if you would compare two regions, one with lots of massive stars, the other one without massive stars, you may expect to see uh, some difference. And some things that I didn't put on this slide, but also turbulent fragmentation um, um, some mechanism theory is uh, also predicting if you increase if you increase the density that you should have a dramatic increase also in the number of brown dwarfs. And finally, the disk interactions are also more probable. So you have a larger probability of ejecting objects from disks if you have lots of stars that are uh, nearby, right? So you have more dynamic interaction. So Many scenarios predict that we should see some difference, although it's quite difficult to, you know, to, to get the numbers of how much uh, uh, this difference should be. But the idea here, our idea was to start looking uh, at, at, at different regions and just simply trying to see if we will see uh, something. And so um, now to, to introduce the uh, initial mass function, because this is something I'm going to show a few times uh, throughout this talk. Uh, initial mass function, you probably know, this is a distribution of masses that comes out uh, as a result of the formation um, formation process. And this is a kind of a, a state of art the plot from, from, from about 10 years ago or, or a little bit more. And so this includes uh, young cluster associations, fields, and also open and globular, or globular clusters, so older clusters. So you will see that on this right hand side, so this is stellar part on the right hand side, this slope is, is fairly consistent between different regions, right? So this is the, the famous Salpeter slope. And then the, the mass function has a kind of a turnover and um, which, which is, well, slightly different from region to region. And then you have uh, on the left hand side, so this is where you have brown dwarfs at, at that time. So, you, you know, we were seeing that, uh, that, uh, you could have all kinds of slopes, so from flat, from up, up going upwards, going downwards. And so this is, you know, you could ask, is this real, really a difference between these different regions? I would say this is mostly a consequence of incompleteness of most of the surveys because it's, it, we, are, we are really talking about very faint and, and, and uh, uh, of our, well, observations. And so it's difficult to have spectroscopic follow-up for lots of these objects. And I'm going to actually uh, tell you a little bit about what are the problematics of membership and finding actually uh, brown dwarfs. 
Um, and so over the last 10, 12 years, I have been uh, in uh, co-leading, let's say, uh, this survey that is called Substellar Objects in Nearby Young Clusters. I'm not going to talk about this survey in any detail. Um, I will just say that it includes very deep imaging and lots of spectroscopy. We took lots of spectra to confirm actually our objects. And so this is kind of a summary uh, slide where, you, where what we find is that for each 10 stars, you for something somewhere about between uh, actually two and five round dwarfs. So this is, uh, I put here four stars, but really it's, it, there is a span uh, between two and five round dwarfs. Uh, you form less, even less, about 10 times less uh, these what we call planetary mass objects. Uh, and planetary mass objects, we call them, you know, objects that have masses below, our estimated masses below 13 Jupiter masses, but are free floating in clusters. So I, I consider them kind of a class of round dwarfs, just low mass. And then there is a big question mark down here. So below, I would say five to 10 Jupiter masses, even we really, uh, really don't know. And so this is not only found in Sonic, it has been found in many other surveys um, that, that were searching for brown dwarfs in nearby star forming regions. So nearby star forming regions, so these are regions that are located for, uh, at distances uh, less than 400 parsecs. This is understand understandable because of course, uh, these objects are very faint. So you want to observe them. Um, nearby if you can. However, nearby star forming regions are actually mostly very loose conglomerates of low mass stars. So what I, do I want to say? They have very low densities and they don't have any OB stars. So we cannot really, uh, or they have very few OB stars. So we cannot really test the, the, the photo evaporation scenario in this way. Um, the only exception is the Orion Nebula cluster, which is, uh, which is quite, uh, well, which is both rich in, in um, in massive stars and also denser than other star forming regions. And, and in fact, one of, of the works that kind of, uh, uh, you know, stressed the urgency maybe on checking these environmental differences was this work from 2016, where they saw, so brown dwarfs are here on the right hand side. So if you look just at the black, black uh, line, so you see that they found here approximately at, at the substellar limit, kind of a, a dip, and then again, increase in, in the number of brown dwarfs. Now I must say that this, work has never been spectroscopically confirmed. So I'm, uh, maybe it's not uh, that trustworthy, but at the time it was really kind of something that was triggering uh, triggering my interest, uh, in fact, uh, to seeing if there is anything about these environmental difference, differences. So then we constructed, design a new program where we would look at massive young clusters and look for brown dwarfs in regions that have very different environments from those that we have in nearby star forming regions. So these are uh, regions that have been selected in, uh, in this program. I will present here these first two, uh, the RCW36 is still work in progress. Um, so RCW38 is, is, well, the densest stellar system within, within four kiloparsecs. So it's, it's, it's the densest cluster that we can observe. It's at a distance of 1.7 kiloparsec. It's 10 times denser than uh, NGC 1333. So this is one of our, uh, the, so these are chameleon one, NGC 1333. These are regions that we studied in, in our sonic survey and, and two orders of magnitude denser than chameleon one, for example. And it's very rich in massive stars. So many of these objects here are, are, are O and B stars. Um, NGC 2244, so you may know this object. So it's a cluster that is found in, this, in the heart of the Rosette Nebula. It's a very beautiful, uh, uh, nebula on the night nice sky. It's it's a loose, very loose cluster. It doesn't have uh, high density, but it's uh, again very rich in massive stars. And then the third one was the one that has a density similar to nearby star forming regions, but it has very few B stars. So it, we are trying kind of to to access different env environmental properties in in terms of stellar density and the amount of uh, OB stars. So now. How do we actually know, you know, if you look at these clusters, of course, you know that uh, there is a mixture. You are not only seeing population that is there in these clusters, but you are also seeing, uh, the, you are also seeing uh, uh, field stars, right? So the question is, how do, we, uh, how do we go about that? How do you know which stars belong to the clusters and, how, and, and which don't? And so this usually first starts with photometry where you take near infrared or uh, even optical photometry if there's not much extinction in your cluster. And then we, you know, this, these are some examples in nearby star forming region, regions and in one of these massive clusters. And so what you will see here, these are the known members, these diamonds are previously known members of the region. So we basically extend this downward. So 
why on the right hand side so so this the, remember these are young regions so all these sources are actually uh, pre-main sequence uh, in a pre-main sequence phase so they will be redder than the rest of the bulk population so this is all here field population however these photometric selections we, we really have uh, a very large fraction of contamination contamination comes from from the foreground sources from the background sources red and background giants mostly so you will have a, a, a lot of a lot of mi mixture in there so this is one of the cmds from uh, from NGC 2244, so you see this here we are complete uh, down to about uh, 10, 20 uh, Jupiter masses, which is quite amazing because these massive clusters are far away, right? The ne nearby star forming regions are less than 400 parsecs. These clusters are, are at 1.5 kiloparsecs. Okay, so this is why nobody has been doing this because it's quite challenging. Things are these things are you know you have to be very have very very deep photometry and then it's really difficult to actually confirm them. So as I will show. Okay, so then we have our photometry. How do we actually go about you know knowing, you know we, we will select things that are red here. We can do that in this cluster even not. So down here you see the, so the stellar part is well separated, but here uh, field and the and 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 young things are actually uh, mixing and so that's that's. Uh, that's a complication and so there are different ways how you can what you can do about this the first one is selecting things from for example mid infrared access and x-rays so these kind of surveys have very high success rates in in terms that they don't have so much contamination but they will inherently uh, have some biases included for example if you use mid infrared access to select young stars uh, you will be biased towards stars that have disks so I will be presenting a little bit of all these three, uh, three kinds of um, um, membership determinations. So the first one is a spectroscopy. So you take a spectrum and you can then uh, uh, determine spectral type and use. I will show you how we do that. But this is, of course, time consuming and requires uh, multi-object spectrographs. But we do this and whenever we can do it. Do it. For nearby star forming regions, we were doing, them, doing it always. You can do a statistical. Um, uh, decontamination in, in color magnitude diagram. So you basically observe a control field. So this is a field that is relatively nearby to the cluster, but doesn't contain any young population. So then you can use statistical methods to, uh, to subtract, you, you know, how many stars you should have in particular parts of, of a CMD in a cluster and in the field. However, you know, you can get some statistical idea of, of the IMF, but you have no way to identify individual members, right? You just know how many members you should have in this uh, must be. And finally, kinematics. Kinematics are very powerful to uncover co-moving groups. Clusters are young. They're still preserving their, uh, their uh, you know, the angular momentum that the, that the cloud initially had. Um, however, this has, this has been difficult, at, at least until recently, right? Gaia is, is helping a lot, although Gaia is sensitive to brown dwarfs uh, only for the nearest uh, star forming regions, the, the, those that are very far away, they, we cannot see brown dwarfs yet with Gaia. All right, so when we take our spectra, how do we distinguish between stars uh, and brown dwarfs? So this is an example from models where you have a young star of the temperature 3500 kelvins and this is a brown door so you can see clearly that that uh, the shape spectral shape is 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 changing um, in both uh, in the optical and in the near infrared so actually um, you know getting the spectral type, type is not uh, such a big deal in a way uh, so you can get uh, effective temperature from the atmospheric models and you can get the extinction and spectral types when you do uh, comparison to temp spectral templates or atmospheric uh, models. Um, this is a, and so the, the, the spectral types can also be determined in different ways so that you can determine them by comparing it to some spectral templates. Uh, and you can also use a set of indices. There are plenty of them available in the literature. And so I just, I'm showing this uh, just to introduce this work that has been uh, led by my PhD student, Victor Almendros, and uh, he took about 3,000 near infrared spectra, uh, and and um, and well, you will see. Did a lots of analysis how we can derive uh, spectral types for young and old populations, and how can we actually distinguish between young and old populations? And so, what you see here in 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 gray, these are um, 
uh, old sources, so field sources, and the yellow ones are young sources, so members of star forming regions. So you see, for example, spectral types here. Um, well, of course, they overlap because this is just the uh, derivation of spectral types. Yeah, uh, but how do you go about actually separating? If you have a spectrum, how do you, you know, you can have a, a, some particular spectral type, but how do you know that, that this object is young or if it's old, right? So the, uh, we can use what we call gravity sensitive features. There are several of them throughout the optical and the near infrared spectra. So some of them, so you see here on top, um, these are objects uh, in Taurus. So this is a very young region. Upper score is somewhat older region and then the field, which is the oldest, of course. And so you will see, for example, alkali lines, they become uh, much deeper and have larger equivalent widths if you go, uh, if as you progress in age, right? Here you can see it really nicely, this um, potassium one line in, in, in the J band in the near infrared. There is also a very, a very useful feature here in the H band. It's actually the, this very broad uh, band peak. We call it H band peak. And you see how, for example, uh, the, so this is a, the purple one is the old spectrum here and the one below is the young spectrum. So you see clearly there are some important differences uh, in how this, uh, how this peak looks like. So these are all features that we can use to actually, uh, you know, say that our objects are young when, well, when they are young, of course, that means that they belong to our, our star forming region of interest. And, and so this has been, you know, done for, for a long time. People have know what are these gravity sensitive features, but we have kind of, uh, my, uh, Victor has done a very nice demonstration of uh, using machine learning methods. So I'm going to mention we are using some supervised machine learning methods, but I'm not going to go into any particular de technical details about this. I think it would be too much. If you have any questions, just ask me at the end. And so the input here are these 3000 spectra. Uh, they, they, they are separated into two classes, young and old. And so then we try to train our model to actually distinguish between the two classes. And and the random forest algorithm has, uh, can return you what is called the feature importance. So feature in this case would be each wavelength. Uh, so we input entire spectra in, into, the, in, into the model. And, and so random forest tells you which parts of the spectrum are the most important for it to actually make a distinction between something that is old and that is young. So the, the most important feature is definitely this age band peak. So this is all in the near infrared, right? Uh, age band peak. So this is this uh, this region that I was uh, showing you before. It's this part here. So it's a, it's a very strongly gravity sensitive. And then you have a bunch of other features. Uh, so all these um, alkali lines that I show you, there is also one in here in the K band. So you have lots of features that you can use uh, to distinguish between young and old, obje old objects. And Victor in his work also uh, presented a new gravity sensitive index because, you know, it's not always straightforward to use uh, machine learning uh, techniques for anybody. And, uh, uh, and so uh, he found this index that really separates very well. So in, in, in gray, you see the field objects and these colored uh, dots are actually color coded by the age. So coming from the youngest stages towards about 50 uh, mega years in some young moving groups. And so you can see clearly there is a gradient in this index and, and, and this starts to be better separated as you go towards later spectral types. So this is something that we are working on right now, trying to extend this um, this analysis to later spectral type this will be super important uh, for the JWST in fact and um, a similar thing can be also done well has been done with uh, as, where we use the uh, spectra as the input so this is basically what I was mentioning here right so that's the same run um, these are the confusion matrices I'm not so in any case these numbers should be close to hundred if things work well and they in, in, indeed they do. And so then he, we pl over plot the results from, from these machine learning methods where we actually as an input use the entire spectra, remember that, and then plot that on top of this index. So you see that, that they separate very well also again, the old from the young population. And they also help here in this region where, you, where we have some overlap between the two. Okay. Um, when we do the spectroscopic follow-up, uh, we tend to use uh, multiple multi-object spectrographs if possible. And so this is some recent work, uh, again, part of the PhD of Victor Almendros. Uh, we have taken KMOS spectra. So KMOS is, uh, is, uh, has 24 IFUs. 
we set the VLT and we get spectra of yeah, 24 objects at a time. And, and so these are, these are some first, first results and you can see in black, these are the spectra uh, smoothed because you can see that you know, these objects are very faint. So there's quite some noise, but you can smooth that and, comp and compare with, with, the, with uh, templates and you see that there is some uh, very nice fit. And I, I want to just stress that all these analysis I mentioned previously has been done on low resolution spectra. So this is like just a few hundred of spectral resolution. So you can do this at, you don't need the particularly high resolution for this. And, and so we have confirmed, so you see here are the spectral types, these are M5.5, M6, et cetera. So there are about 20 um, confirmed brown dwarfs in this region. And uh, these are really the first uh, brown dwarfs, as far as I know, that are, that have been spectroscopically confirmed and distances above uh, one kiloparsec. So, uh, well, I think I, uh, that's true. Maybe I, if I'm not uh, unaware of some, some recent work. So that much about the spectroscopy. So as I said, spectroscopy is really the most powerful tool we like to use. Uh, sometimes that's not uh, possible. So this is again NGC 2244, the same one where we took this spectra. So the spectra are here in this upper part so sorry, I didn't say that. These green uh, green uh, symbols are actually Gaia members. So this is where Gaia is uh, giving us proper motion, so we can actually separate proper motion by proper motions, uh, most probably member. But spectra are taken down here in this region, right? So where we don't have any more Gaia, we don't have any other indication of of the membership. So this is where we need spectra. Really. But prior to that, we also do this what I said statistical determination of the membership. So here you have. Um, you have in black the uh, stars that have that are observed towards the cluster NGC 2244. So it's a mix of the cluster and the field population. And in red, I'm showing the the control field uh, photometry. And so what you will see immediately that this region you, you almost don't see any red sources here. So this is very nicely um, the, the the clusters. So this part is easy. But then you know you have to go basically. I, I, if I want to explain it in a simple way, you just go to each of these bins and you just count how many black objects you have, how many red objects you have, and then you subtract that and you say, okay, I expect here um, X number of objects that belong to the cluster. So this is, for example, one in orange, these are the objects that passed, uh, passed this, uh, this kind of cleaning. And you can do this, of course, uh, varying the uh, size of these cells, where do they start, what is the relative extinction between the cluster and the field. Sometimes they, they have slightly different extinctions. And all of this gives you, of course, lots of uncertainties, but you can propagate this into your IMF. So then we get more robust and statistically significant IMFs. Finally, um, proper motions. Proper motions, of course, are, are super useful and very powerful tool to separate things that belong to some region or, or don't belong to a particular region. Gaia has been very instrumental to that. So this is an example from uh, SCO B2 associations where you have here, you see um, things that belong to this association as separate very nicely from the rest of the of the bulk population of the galaxy uh, along your line of sight of course this region has very large proper motions you, you can see your values on the axis um, so these are nearby regions which are very easy uh, to distinguish in this way there are projects like cosmic dance uh, that actually they they download their own you know search archives and download lots of photometry uh, lots of uh, images and and then they do proper motion based on uh, mostly on ground based data. They, they have had some very, very nice results. In some cases, you know, you know the idea going into regions where, where Gaia doesn't uh, really go because, it, you know, there may be extinction. So you may use infrared data, etc. So they're having some very, very nice results in many regions. I'm just showing this one here. And finally, uh, uh, what I also want to show, this is again, work in NGC 2244. So you see this is kind of becoming our favorite cluster. I want to do all the analysis on this cluster. Um, so this is something I've been working on right now. Um, so we can also get, uh, get, get uh, pro, you know, selection by proper motions. Uh, although you, you see now compare the proper motions here, the values here is just minus two milliard seconds per year. Uh, at the x-axis so these are very you know this is a very distant cluster so this is at 1.5 uh, 
uh, kiloparsecs, but we, we actually used a probabilistic random forest uh, algorithm, which you know you train it by some known members. So giving uh, giving uh, including in your training settings that you know there are members that you know they are not members. So you can then um, get from uh, different you know, optical neuroinfrared photometry, proper motions, parallaxes, etc. So you can, we basically what we do, we, we you know, double the amount of uh, known members uh, in this region, and then we can do a lot of, uh, lots of different analysis. Now I'm showing this because this is a way to uh, constrain, in this case, the stellar part of the mass function. We don't, in this class, we cannot go to brown walls with Gaia, um, but we have some future plans with, with dense mate. And, and so uh, I don't want to go, you know, go away from my topic. My topic mostly are today are, are brown dwarfs, but I, these are some really nice results. So I wanted to show it. So things that we can do in this cluster. So I'm plotting here uh, the relative proper motions. Uh, and so to, you know, proper motion that minus the, the mean proper motion of the, on the cluster. And, and then these vectors, proper motion vectors are color coded by their angle between uh, the angle between the proper motion vector and the line that is connecting each star with the center of the cluster. And so the, the purple colors means that these are stars that are actually moving away from the cluster, from the center of the cluster, and green ones are those that are going towards, uh, towards the center, and the white ones then are those that are basically perpendicular to that line. And so what you can see very nicely that we are detecting an expan uh, expansion in, in this cluster. So, uh, Gaia data are really amazing. There are so many things one, one can do with that. But let me go back to brown dwarfs. Uh, so what is our data set in massive clusters? We have taken imaging in, with at Gemini, at NACO. So for example, this is RCW38. Here is a, uh, our, uh, the first image that we took. So with NACO, this was a paper from 2017, which we have now expanded largely on the, uh, with, with uh, using Hokai. And we have a very nice data set uh, taken with Hawkeye at the VLT, which actually is using um, this ground-based, uh, ground layer, sorry, ground layer uh, AO correction. And we have some really very nice data. And so this, I will show today results in RCW38, which is work by uh, Karolina Kubiak, who, who was a postdoc with me until very recent. And so here are the results. Uh, I'm showing the IMFs. Uh, which are in the form shown in the form in the power law form. So dn over dm on the on so number of stars per mass interval on the x axis and on the y axis on the x axis you have the mass. And uh, in nearby star forming regions, the slope of the IMF uh, is somewhere between 0 0.6 and 1. Now, don't think that this means that there is a uh, there are differences necessarily between these regions. It, this really reflects the uncertainties. There are plenty of uncertainties. They come from our, you know, lack of knowledge of ages, of uh, um, distances, extinction laws, uh, models that one uses to get the mass. So there's lots of uh, lots of uh, uncertainties in all of this. Um, and so what are we finding here? We find that you know this is the first work NACO work on uh, RCW38. This is uh, the, the recent work by Carolina. You see we are getting uh, IMFs that are fairly within this, this range. So here is NGC 2244. We are getting a brown dwarf IMF at around uh, one. So, so these, uh, what I want to say is that these, these results are really in line with what we have been finding in uh, nearby star from the regions. Another thing we can look at are, is what we call star to brown dwarf number ratio. So it's just the, the ratio between number of stars with uh, uh, and the number of brown dwarfs. You can change these uh, these uh, limits, mass limits. One solar mass here, 0 0.03 solar uh, solar masses. This is just some limits that are often used, so they are useful to actually compare between the regions. And so, this star to brown dwarf ratio varies somewhere between two and five in nearby star forming regions. Again, to, these are the just the very large uncertainties that we have. And, uh, and this distribution, this histogram here is showing uh, the ratio in NGC 2244. Um, if you remember, we had, you know, this includes all the uncertainties we had. And so we had different realization of this statistical de de decontamination. So that's why we have a distribution of values. And it, in fact, it, it is known that, you know, that Chabrier, so this is one of these standard IMFs, is largely under predicting uh, the amount of, of brown dwarfs that we are seeing in star forming regions. 
And so if we plot that, so this is star to brown dwarf ratio as a function of stellar density. Uh, you can see, uh, you know, these bars, long bars are just these, uh, uh, the ranges uh, for each uh, star forming region. And, and then where you see written OB, these are the regions with OB stars. Um, and so basically what we can see that uh, there is no evidence for any significant influence on this uh, ratio coming from both stellar density. So you see that this is the x-axis or presence of massive stars there. You see here, this is perfectly overlapping with these regions that have almost no OB stars. Uh, so I would say that our first results, our results so far, I really see not, not, uh, not seeing any difference. And if there is any, it must be somewhere we, uh, hidden within our very large uncertainties. And so at the end, uh, I'm coming really to the last few slides of my talk. I just want to tell you a, a bit about plans for JWST. Uh, so now this is becoming all much more realistic. You know, previously it has been always uh, this uncertainty if things uh, will work out, it seems that things are really going well. And so the first one is, uh, for, first of, project that I'm showing here is when we want to amplify actually the phase space of stellar densities of types of clusters uh, better said, uh, so we, we have approved the uh, uh, program with uh, Mario Guarcello as a PI and co-PI on this project. And um, so, you know, there are people interested in disks uh, and we have people interested in brown dwarfs like myself. And so we will get, uh, you know, uh, near infrared, mid infrared imaging uh, in Westerland 1, which is uh, one of these starburst clusters. Uh, this one located at four, four kiloparsecs. So this is again a very, very extreme environment and it's, it's going to be very interesting uh, to get some, to see how brown dwarfs look, look like in that. And so the last thing that I want to tell you about are these planetary mass objects. So these are, I think this is something that is really coming and this is, will become, I mean, it's already a bit of a hot topic, but I think this will in the, in the very near future be super, super interesting. There will be some very cool results, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so these are free floating objects with masses uh, below 13 Jupiter masses. We have found so far that there are, that these uh, objects seem to be rare, at least down to where we can, we can see them uh, approximately, again, very large span, 10 to 50 times less common than stars. And this has been found in Sonic, but also in, uh, in other works in Sigma Orionis. So again, this is a very nice spectroscopic confirmation down to very low masses and upper Scorpius as well. And so this is something that has come out in nature astronomy very recently, a work uh, by Nuria uh, Miret. He, and she, what she finds that, uh, you know, they find a population of about 70 to 170 uh, planetary mass object uh, candidates uh, in, up, in um, yeah, upper Scorpius. Uh, however, you know, this sounds like a relatively large number, but actually there are 3,000 stars in that cluster. So if you if you divide that again, you get uh, that this is in agreement with other clusters that are maybe a bit less populated. Um, however, this there is a large span because uh, there, the, the ages are uncertain and also uh, there is a big need for spectroscopic confirmation. So my guess, my expectation that some of these or a good fraction of these will be probably, you know, brown or low, just above this uh, brown dwarfs with slightly higher masses than, than 13 Jupiter masses. Uh, but there will be, I'm sure, also a significant fraction of these will be planetary mass object candidates because this work also actually includes proper motion. So it's not only photometric selection. If it would be just a photometric selection, I wouldn't even show it because I don't really trust purely photometric selection. So uh, this will be very nice when, when we get actually spectroscopic confirmation of this. But just remember these objects are in general not very common. And, and I would say this is down to five Jupiter masses at best, right? The, how this depends how, you know, how deep are our data, where are we actually complete? And below these masses, we have absolutely no idea what is going on. And this is really something that is super interesting because this is where we think that all, all these planets that may be ejected from the disk, disks would have to contribute. So it will be really interesting if mass function continues, uh, uh, you know, or, or it, it has some kind of more abrupt change. So this is something to look at in the near future. And so we are having plans to, to do that, uh, to look at the objects, uh, to search for the objects uh, down to one Jupiter mass. So this will happen again with um, JWST. We are part of, I'm part of a GTO campaign the, the, and the leader of this project is Alex Schultz from St. Andrews. And so this is a simulation of, this is a, an image of cluster 
NGC 3033, this is in Perseus, and these are the fields we will observe with this instrument, which is called NIRIS, and it has a wide uh, slitless uh, spectrograph. And so this is a simulation, this is zoom in into one of these fields, how is this going to look like? So each of these thing, little thingies is a spectrum. And, um, and this, this will be very low resolution spectra, so about, I think, the 200, which is, as I showed you, is, is enough to get some reasonable understanding of their, um, of their surface craftings. And so this is bringing me to my la last slide uh, and a few, um, you know, few statements that maybe would be my takeaway messages. So first one that for every 10 stars, you will have been star forming regions about two to five brown dwarfs. Uh, and that the brown dwarf formation, the Milky Way, does seem to be universal. And we see no clear evidence so far for any variations in the efficiency of formation of brown dwarfs, very low mass stars, um, due to obese stars or changes in stellar densities. And so if there, are any, if there is any influence of the environment in brown dwarf formation, it should be on a much more subtle level than what we can actually see. And as I showed you, we are really anxiously awaiting the JWST data. So, you know, stay tuned. There will be some very interesting results coming in the next years. And thanks very much. Thank you very much, Cora, <clears throat> for this wonderful talk. <clears throat> and then I will give the word to Rainer that he will manage all the question and answer the session. So please, uh, Rainer. For all participants, uh, raise your hand and Rainer will manage to let you talk. Exactly, so please uh, ask your questions. You can also type them via the chat. Meanwhile, while you think of your questions, I would ask <laughs> that Pora what the, I mean, how far out can you go with these studies with James Webb now? I mean, it's obvious you, you want a lot more massive clusters. How far out can you go? Can you go to eight or 10 kiloparsecs maybe? No. 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 Even not, not with James Webb? No. I mean, oh, you yeah. see Westerland, which is at uh, four kiloparsecs, we'll get down to 20 Jupiter masses. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can extend it a bit further, but then you will get only the most massive brown dwarfs, but uh, no galactic center, well, galactic center for Not sure. Not the galactic center, but, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, okay. Not that far, yeah, 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 that's too far. So you need to- I, I don't have a, from the top of my hand, I don't have a number exactly yeah. how far we'll go, I but it. just on a, a prox. So and you, you see, and Westerland, for example, is, is three to five mega years old, so it doesn't have so much extinction. So you need a bit, these environments that don't have much extinction and and, and, you know, young massive clusters often do have lots of extinction. Okay, so you want the extremely large telescope. Well, yeah, but that's going to be dif different because you, the fields of you will be much smaller. Um, but yeah. Have you, I know that, for example, I, I mean, this is, this is a question out of the blue, but we, we are involved here in the square kilometer array. So I know that low mass stars can have flares and they can be very bright radio sources at times. Can brown dwarfs be detected in radio? Would they that can, be a possibility? They can. There have been some studies. I, I don't know many details about these studies, but they have, there are some brown dwarfs that have been uh, detected. I mean, when you, when you say, yeah, um, you know, younger brown dwarfs are also detected, uh, well, via their disks, for example. Mm -hmm. So you can detect, this is also something that is detectable in the radio because they have disks or they may have even envelopes when they're really young. Uh, but then uh, older brown dwarf populations and, and, the, and the players, this can also be detected. I, I think there are, few, there are not many studies in any case about that, but I don't know many more details. So. Questions? No one has any question. Your talk was too clear. It was too clear or nobody understood anything? <laughs> Two right. options. <laughs> oh no, brown, brown dwarf, brown dwarf people here. Yeah. Mm. Oh, there's Isa. Isa, yeah. please. Um, I'm asking most probably a stupid question but sure. because I'm, I'm not an expert at all. So uh, um, you're talking about uh, the James Webb telescope, which is great, but what about the ELT? Is there any hope to, to get much deeper, much uh, yeah. higher distances and so on with the, with the instrumentation for the ELT for the future? Yes. When, yes. when I will be retired, mm -hmm. but you want to be? 
<laughs> yeah, I I hope really to get some opportunity to 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 get to the to VLT ELT. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. We will be observing uh, brown dwarfs with ELT. So, um, but I see ELT more as something that will be useful for characterization of these objects because you know fields of view uh, included will will be much much smaller than what you can do with James Webb. So James, this is why James Webb is really useful for us because it, uh, we can we can do large surfaces and I mean areas on the sky. Um, uh, and I think with ELT, there will be more, um, I, I would say, for example, for METIS, uh, I would be also interested in looking, you know, um, at disk, um, and disk kinematics and this kind of thing. So you will, I think we will, with the ELT, it will not be so much the search for round dwarfs, but uh, characterization of these least massive objects. This is my expectation. But certainly, we will see very, very, very faint objects. Yes. Okay. Thank you. What's uh, the I, 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 I take the opportunity to to congratulate you because of the talk was great. So thank, thank you. Thanks for that. <laughs> thank you. We have Maria Rosa Zapatero. Yes. Thank you, Coral. Thank you very much for the presentation. I enjoyed it very much. It was very clear. Thank I, you. Hi, Maria Rosa. I, yeah, I, I would like uh, to concur with your uh, conclusion that uh, there are many brown dwarfs mm -hmm. uh, um, in uh, everywhere, actually, not only young clusters, if mm -hmm. they are young clusters, they Absolutely. must be in the field as well. And uh, I would like uh, to add that if you think about uh, in the solar neighborhood, the, mm -hmm. the closest uh, solar neighborhood, we have as many brown dwarfs as uh, stars in the yeah. solar neighborhood. So uh, exactly. I think this is very indicative of the high abundance of ground dwarfs in yeah, our Yeah, definitely, definitely. I agree with you. Yeah, today, you know, I, I concentrated on young brown dwarfs, so I wasn't talking about anything else, but there are huge populations of brown dwarfs in, in mm. the Milky Way in general. And, uh, and, and as you know, Maria Rosa, for a long time, the results from the field and the results from the clusters were not really uh, agreeing, but I would say that field results have always had uh, much larger actually uncertainties because of all the um, um, age determination, the, and age students. determination and, uh, yes. and history and etc. that yes. you have to correct yes. for. And I think recently results are going into the direction that that new newest results are going along with these uh, the results we are having in star forming regions. So which is really nice at the end because. Yes. They must uh, originate from star forming regions and then go go away, right? In a, in a... Yes, exactly. They they have a, a smaller masses, so they they are ejected more easily from from the clusters. Yeah. So they populate in the in the the disk of the galaxy quite well, quite numerously actually, and they are there. But they are more difficult to detect because they are intrinsically faint, as you have because, uh, yeah. shown. Yeah, you have so Maria Rosa. You, I mean, I know Maria Rosa is working also on uh, on radio uh, radio detection. So if you want to say something about that, I'm sure you are much better than me. Oh, radio detections. Um, they are pretty pretty faint, and uh, um, of course there is no photospheric. Uh, uh, there is no hope for the photospheric detection in radio, including Alma. Uh, they are too faint. Mm -hmm. However, if they have uh, uh, discs. And they can be detected. And actually, there are some brown dwarfs with protoplanetary disks that have been detected, uh, for example, in Sigma, in Sigma Orionis and many other young regions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that the mass of the disks around young brown dwarfs scale with the mass of the central brown dwarf, as it happens uh, with the stars. Uh, yeah. then, uh, so it's possible that brown dwarfs uh, have their own planetary systems as well. So, although the mass reservoir is very small, so it's, yes, you know, that's true. So the planets have to be very small. Very well. small. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it is possible. Thank you, Maria Ros. You're welcome, Coral. Thank you very much for the presentation. I enjoy it. Any further questions? No. Okay, so 
thank you very much again, Cora. Um, there's a thank large virtual. Thank you very much. Uh, we are very much looking forward to seeing you here in Granada in October okay. or earlier, if possible. <laughs> Meanwhile, everyone stay safe and, and thank you very much. Great talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Thank you.